Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, a philanthropic community partner since 1922, and a proud supporter of numerous community organizations. More information at smithville.com. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. The leaves are out in full and the flowers are in bloom. Discover fun new destinations to enjoy the Indiana outdoors. Travel to Mitchell, where Indiana's oldest bow hunters club continues a 50 year old tradition. Explore Owen County's Cataract Falls, the state's tallest waterfall. Meet Salisbury, Indiana's eclectic historian who is preserving the town's history one model at a time. And welcome Indianapolis's Moxie, a pop grunge band breaking molds across the Midwest. Stay tuned for great ways to enjoy the spring sunshine. It's all coming up right now on the weekly special. Welcome to the weekly special. I'm Erica Sagone. Spring is a wonderful time to discover new hobbies and new destinations, particularly those that preserve great Indiana traditions like the White River Bow Hunters Club. For over 50 years, it has been the place for enthusiasts across the state. Down a winding country road just outside Bedford, Indiana, the White River Bow Hunters Club hosts the International Bow Hunter Organization for the first leg of the Triple Crown Championship. The club was formed by four individuals in 1951. It started very small, just a handful of people. Held their meetings and stuff and had their club in a chicken house down on White River. And it progressed to what it is now, around 100 people. And we're the oldest continuous uh, club in the state of Indiana. The White River Bow Hunters has been a, a staple in our organization for pretty much the beginning. You know, the IBO is 31 years old. They've been involved with the organization for 30 years. In the beginning, there was competition, but it was not on a national level. This is the first leg of the national championship where we actually bring archers from all over the country to compete. And this brings us together for camaraderie and to bring like-minded archers together to help further our cause. If you're a, a competitor in archery or a manufacturer, you know about the event in Bedford. We have people come here from Australia, Italy, all kinds of people from Canada. We have a lot of people come here and compete. We've run up to 1,800 shooters and then all these people have uh, family members and friends they bring with them. So you, you know, you get a couple thousand people easy. The competition here is not only uh, the novice, the very beginner, that wants to get involved in 3D, but we also have pros that are the best archers in the world. They all come together and compete at this uh, competition. Divided into multiple classes based on age and skill level, competitors walk the natural trail course on over 500 acres. Each scene along the trail features animals at an unknown distance with scores ranging from a five for a body shot to an 11 for a perfect bullseye and a wide variety of three-dimensional animal shapes and sizes. We've been out here for about a month and a half trying to get um, the ranges all set up, get the animals all set out there where they belong, and that's where our club members enjoy coming out and seeing all the people that you see from year to year to year that will remember you as being at the White River Bow Hunters Classic Shoot. The mother, the father, the children all come, grandparents, their whole family will be here to shoot this competition just because it's an outdoor sport that people um, can do with their families and everybody enjoys the same thing. We have kids as small as two and three years old out here shooting 
and we have competitors as old as in their 80s. So we have classes for all of those divisions. It is a lifelong sport and it's a family sport. You'll see a lot of families out here competing together. And that's what we want to do. We want to preserve that competition, preserve that heritage, and pass it on to future generations. The club also focuses on youth outreach and hunter education, something that will remain particularly important as this will be the last year for the competition after the death of longtime leader and IBO director Gary Baldwin. He, he loved the club and he just devoted all his time to it. It was a real difficult decision to make to give up the event. You got a lot of people getting age on them. They're getting tired. That's a long run. I, there's not another IBO event that has ever ran this long. Gary always kept everybody, uh, he wanted everything perfect. And uh, that's the way it worked out, and that helped keep this event here. Because when IBO come in to check everything, they knew it was right. They've been uh, tremendous partners in this Triple Crown, and we're really gonna miss the, the fine people that, that help out at this event. Gary Baldwin was very much part of this, and there's just a lot of history there that, that is hard to replace. We hope that some of the younger shooters step up and, and can fill some of those shoes, but as a founding father and someone that we look up to tremendously, it's gonna be very difficult to replace that. We got a lot of dedicated members. We just got a good group of people. It's a great place to go, have fun, a lot of stuff going on. We work with a lot of kids. Hope it stays just like it is. The White River Bow Hunters Club will host their summer open in June in run up to the 51st annual Bow Hunters Jamboree. Learn more at WhiteRiverBowHunters.com. For those looking for a more leisurely way to enjoy the outdoors, Indiana has some incredible natural wonders you have to see to believe. Strolling along Mill Creek, the serene silence gives way to a rumbling roar as the gentle creek transforms into one of Indiana's most beautiful wonders, Cataract Falls. As the creek rolls down a seemingly endless ride of cascades through the upper and lower falls, it descends 86 feet in elevation, making Cataract Falls the largest waterfall in Indiana by volume. The plentiful wildlife of the creek and surrounding areas make Cataract Falls a prime location for the state's earliest timber mills. By the late 1800s, however, the industry faded and the historic landscape became a refuge of beauty and recreation. For almost 100 years, the area remained privately owned, but by the 1960s, the United States government made concerted efforts to purchase the falls and surrounding area. The construction of Cagle's Mill Dam, as well as its accompanying reservoir, further ensured Cataract Falls protection. Today, this incredible Indiana wonder is located within the Lieber State Recreation Area, preserving its beauty for generations to come. Cataract Falls is part of the Lieber State Recreation Area, 
Learn more about how to visit this one-of-a-kind Indiana wonder at in.gov dnr. Well, the small town of Salisbury, Indiana is home to the state's longest railway viaduct. And local historian Larry Shute is using that connection to preserve the town's history in a unique way. The first time I had citizens come in that live in this community, older people and even some young ones, they'd walk right up here to, and look down here. And the first thing they would see was either a place they knew about, familiar with, lived there, but it just, it blew their mind. They couldn't believe they'd seen it. This is Larry Shute's hometown, Salisbury, a tiny rural place in Southern Indiana where he's lived his whole life. Or rather, it's a scale model of Salisbury, as it looked decades ago in its heyday, that Larry built from scratch. There's the Yoho General Store, which is still a treasure today. There's his own childhood home, which is still around too. The enormous tulip trussle, just outside of town. And memorable spots like the feed store, train depot, and Dutch's Cafe, all which closed long ago. It's a model train set to the extreme. It has lights and sound and plenty of small town history. I've kind of always modeled things because I couldn't have the real thing. I knew that I could never afford to own a real railroad. So I chose modeling to compensate for that desire, and it worked. Larry began building this precise, incredibly detailed replica in 2006, finding that it combined many things he loved. Salisbury, of course, but also railroads, model trains, and photography. Larry remembers getting his first camera around 1957 and documenting the town, photographing streets and buildings and scenes of everyday life. I did that, but not knowing what I was gonna use it for, I just did it. So I shot probably, I'd say 100 pictures. Anytime there was any kind of thing going to happen that would change the face of the community, I wanted to be sure I had pictures of it before it happened, and then pictures immediately following. Larry was a volunteer firefighter in his community for 50 years. He and his wife had two daughters and raised their family there. He's basically the town historian. No one knows Salisbury better than Larry. Over the years, he could sense his beloved town changing. The high school closed, Dutch's cafe shuttered, and other places followed suit. I don't believe I could have gotten any more guidance in life and more knowledge about life anywhere else than here. I didn't want to see this town go away and become something that I wouldn't be proud of. So I had retained all this stuff in my head, if you will, and that's when I decided I wanted to do something to keep this little town alive, at least in my memory. Larry used the photos to piece together the Salisbury he remembered. The photos clued Larry in on the measurements he needed to build everything to scale. New technology like Google Earth let him get even the elevations right. The rest, he filled in the old-fashioned way, by surveying things himself with a measuring wheel. The proudest part of it, I, I guess, is the knowledge that I had in the back of my head that I applied here and helped me make this as accurate as I could. When people would walk in and see a particular thing and, and say to me, oh, there's da-da-da-da, whatever it would be, then I knew I'd made the mark, you know, I'd scored. So I find that very gratifying. Complimentary, yes, but I didn't do it for that reason. I did it for me, but it turns out I did it right for me. One part that wows is Larry's model of the tulip trestle, the longest train trestle in the country at 2,295 feet long. In real life, the bridge connects Salisbury to the community of Tulip, but in Larry's model, it connects to the fictional city named Shootsbury. Back in Salisbury, it is details from a bygone era that draw you in, like the outhouses and LP gas tanks in the backyards. Gathering all of the details for the model has been a trip down memory lane. I can remember probably 56, I'd go to the general store up here and they would have the counters lined with Christmas gifts at Christmas time. 
the cafe, we ate lunch there. It had the best sandwiches in the world ever. Best pies, best milkshakes, all the simple things of life and probably stuff we shouldn't be eating. But it was great. It was great to be a part of that life and a part of that town at that point in time. For Larry, the replica is a labor of love. Nine years after he started building the model, Larry is still adding to it, which begs the question, when will it be finished? Probably when I take my last breath. I, I can't imagine ever completing it because life is what you make it. And I've always tried to be a part of life, a part of the community. And I've always felt like because they, they being this community, gave me so many things that I wanted to give something back. And you can check out the life-size version of Salisbury, including the new Tulip Trestle Observation Deck. Learn more at visitgc.com. Well, a new Indianapolis band is quickly gaining popularity for their pop grunge sounds. Meet Moxie. So my musical passion kind of evolved from playing piano, random notes, writing lyrics, to getting into percussion in my junior high band. After that, I went to high school and was in a punk band and played drums, and then learned guitar from one of the guys in my band and kind of taught myself guitar from there. I was drawn to rock more so than any other genre. I was drawn to kind of the girl rockers, you know, the powerful lead vocalists like Blondie, Joan Jett, just the female rocker, that persona and energy that they bring is something that I always admired and that's kind of always been my style. So what planted the seed for the origin of Moxie going back to me just loving the garage band rock and kind of that grit and raw style. That's what I kind of envisioned, and you know, I found people that wanted the same thing as I did, so we kind of just made it come to fruition. Moxie's music, I would describe it as grungy pop. It's something that you can tap your foot to, something that you can sing along to, and it's catchy, but it also has a lot of edge and buzz to it. When I'm performing, I hope that the audience gets my energy that I'm trying to bring, the words in the songs that we play. I want them to feel the meaning of them and basically just to have a good time and something they can bang their heads to. Coming from being inspired by Joan Jett, Blondie, the big female rockers of rock and roll, to being something of that and being in front of a band and rocking out and getting people to jump up and down the audience, that's huge. That's a dream come true, literally. I think it's important to have a female-led rock band because it's something that, you know, this day and age, we really need female empowerment. Now more than ever, we need women more in the forefront, and I think that what better way to say it than a female up in the front banging your head just like the dudes. To be an inspiration to others, especially younger girls, that's something that is really important to me and I hope that I have shown little girls that they can get weird, they can get out of their shell, they can grab a guitar, grab a snare and just start banging on it. As a musician, I would define success as doing something that makes you happy, something that is fulfilling. I'm super sad when I'm not playing. It's just something that makes me happy. It's something that fills me up. It's just a part of me, and I think that it's something that's always going to stick with me. It's my life. And now, welcome Moxie to the studio. Drive. 
Moxie will be headlining the Indie Pride Festival in June. To learn more about their upcoming performances, be sure to visit their website, moxiemusic.com. Well, that's all for this episode. We hope you find your own way to explore Indiana this spring. Thanks for joining us. And once again, Moxie. Good night.
Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you 